Do you remember the definitions from our first video on reliability? Reliability is the degree to which a measurement or test gives consistent results each time the experiment is performed. For example, Robin Hood is a reliable archer since his arrows consistently land close to each other. Meanwhile, Fluky Luke is not a reliable archer since his arrows go all over the place. Another key term is precision, which is a measure of how close the experimental results are to each other. If the results of an experiment are precise, then the experimental method is reliable. In this video, we will explore factors that affect the reliability of an experiment and ways to improve the reliability of results. Even if we have performed our experiment correctly, we might get slightly different results each time. This may be a result of random errors. A random error is an error that has variable size and direction. That is, random errors affect experiments in unpredictable ways. For example, let's consider Robin Hood. Even though Robin Hood consistently hits the bullseye, his arrow hits a slightly different spot each time. Each shot differs in direction and distance from the centre of the target. We cannot predict exactly where his next arrow will hit because these differences are random. These slight variations in Robin Hood's shots are due to random errors. He is a reliable archer since the size of these random errors is very small. On the other hand, Fluky Luke demonstrates a very large random error. His arrows might hit above, below, or to the side of the target. He might hit close to the bullseye, or he might miss. Fluky Luke is so unpredictable that he cannot shoot consistently, so he is not a reliable archer. Let's consider another example. Suppose that you are trying to measure the intensity of a portable speaker from a distance of 3 metres. You set the speaker to its maximum volume and use a decibel meter to record the sound intensity. Unfortunately, you can hear many sounds in the background. The class next door is watching a documentary on the history of unexpectedly loud, random noises. And there's a traffic jam along the road in front of your school. You manage to collect three measurements before the end of the class. As we can see, the measurements taken at school vary by almost 10 decibels. So how can we tell if random errors actually affected our results? Well, we can compare the variation in our results to the resolution of our decibel meter. Remember, the resolution of an instrument refers to how well the instrument can distinguish between two similar values. In this case, the decibel meter measures sound intensity in increments of 0.1 decibels, so it is fairly accurate and has a moderate resolution. If you would like to revise this, please see our earlier video on accuracy in HSC physics skills. Here, we notice that the variation in our results is much larger than the increments of the decibel meter. Therefore, we may conclude that random errors, such as random fluctuations in background noise, had a very significant effect on the results, making them unreliable. Since the experimental report is due tomorrow, your teacher suggests that you collect more data when you get home. Thankfully, your parents are out and the house is quiet. You repeat the entire experiment and collect a new set of results. As we can see, the difference between each measurement of sound intensity is much smaller than before, being less than one decibel. Even though these differences are larger than the increments of the decibel meter, we can say that the measurements collected at home are more reliable than those collected at school. So where does this random error come from? As the name implies, it is caused by variables that vary randomly between trials. This includes things like temperature, atmospheric pressure, wind speed, humidity, background noise, ambient light and background radiation. Let's see how this applies to an experiment on projectile motion. 
we are trying to determine the range of a cricket ball when it is launched by a catapult at an angle of 35 degrees above the horizontal. In other words, we're finding the distance travelled by the cricket ball. We perform three trials and get slightly different results each time. What could have caused this variation in our results? Well, in the third trial, we might have accidentally launched the ball at a larger angle. After all, it is hard to accurately measure the launch angle using a protractor, let alone maintain the same launch angle across all three trials. If so, the increased launch angle may have caused the cricket ball to travel further. On a similar note, the wind may have blown against the ball in the first trial. If so, this opposing force may have slowed down the ball, causing it to land closer to the catapult and reducing its range. Even though we try to repeat experiments exactly the same each time, there might be minor changes in our experimental setup or conditions which can affect the final result. We'll discuss this in our upcoming videos on validity in HSC physics skills. Now, how do we reduce the effects of random error on our experimental results? Assuming that we do our best to perform an experiment exactly the same each time, there are three main ways that we can do this. Firstly, we can increase the number of trials that we perform. Instead of taking just one measurement, we should collect as much data as possible. So, how many trials is enough? This depends on the experiment that you are doing. Three trials should be considered the bare minimum for an experiment at school. However, you should always try to collect five or more measurements for each data point to check the reliability of your data. Let's go back to the example from our first video on reliability. At the archery competition, Fluky Luke's first arrow hits the bullseye. If we looked at this first arrow alone, we'd have come to the incorrect conclusion that Fluky Luke was just as good as Robin Hood. When he fired two more arrows, we saw that he wasn't very consistent. What if, for every three arrows he fires, one gets close to the bullseye? That would make him a half-decent archer. To be sure about this, we should ask him to keep firing arrows. After enough time, we'd find out that he's got a lot of room for improvement and his first shot was beginner's luck. The second way to reduce the effects of random error is to remove outliers from our results. An outlier is a result which is abnormally large or small. Outliers may be caused by extremely large random errors, making them much bigger or smaller than all the other data points. The only way we can spot an outlier is by collecting lots of results and comparing them. For example, let's consider Robin Hood's archery history over the past five years. As expected, the overwhelming majority of his shots land in the bullseye. But what's this? He completely missed the target during practice last Tuesday. This looks like an outlier. We have to find some way to justify this poor performance on Robin Hood's behalf. If we go back, we'd see that Robin Hood was distracted that day. Someone threw a fake rubber snake on the ground next to him, which made him miss the target. This is a reasonable excuse, so he can keep his reputation as the most reliable archer in all of England. Let's go back to the experiment where we measured the range of a cricket ball launched by a catapult. The results that we've collected show a fair amount of variation, ranging from approximately 18 to 24 metres. Since the first three results weren't very reliable, we repeat the experiment another three times. But for some reason, the last measurement is completely out. If we compare it to the other results, we can easily conclude that it's an outlier because it's much smaller than all the others. Why did this occur? Perhaps the catapult jammed when we conducted the sixth trial. If so, the ball would have been launched at a lower speed, so its range would be reduced. 
In any case, we should ignore this outlier when performing calculations. This brings us to the third method of reducing the effects of random error, which is to calculate the average of repeated measurements. The average is calculated by taking the sum of all the measurements for each trial and dividing by the total number of measurements. When we average our results, the values that are too large will cancel out the effect of the values that are too small. Therefore, any variation caused by random errors will be smoothed out, giving a more reliable result. The more data we collect, the more reliable our average becomes. However, when we calculate the average, we must exclude any outliers from the calculation because they are unreliable. Let's see how this applies to the experiment where we measured the range of the cricket ball. Firstly, we need to remove any outliers. Then, we find the sum of all the measurements and divide by the total number of measurements, which is 5. Finally, we round the average to the correct number of significant figures. Each range is given to three significant figures, so we round the average to three significant figures. This gives us 21.1 metres, which is a reasonable answer. The values that were too large cancelled out the effect of the values that were too small, giving us a reliable final answer. Now, what would happen if we were to include the outlier when calculating the average? This would give us 19 metres, which doesn't match up with most of the measurements that we've taken and is too small. Therefore, it is important that we exclude outliers when calculating the average. This is particularly important when measuring the intensity of a sound, since the level of background noise can change over time. Let's look at the type of questions you could be asked in exams about reliability. Once again, these are usually asked in the context of a practical investigation, with questions asking, are the results reliable? Why or why not? How can we improve the reliability of an experiment? And how has the investigator improved the reliability of the experimental results? The answers to each question will vary, depending on which experiment you are asked about. In general, you should think about what random errors are present and how you can reduce the size of these random errors. Before we finish the video, let's look at a sample question. Anna performed an experiment to measure the critical angle of perspex using blue light with a wavelength of 450 nanometers. She used the following method. Pause here to read the method for yourself. You might have performed this experiment in Module 3, Waves and Thermodynamics, or in Year 10 Science. Remember, light bends when it travels from one material into another, because objects such as water, glass and perspex cause light to slow down. In this scenario, the light bends so much that it travels along the surface of the perspex. The angle at which this occurs is called the critical angle. How could the reliability of Anna's experiment be improved? Pause here to think about your answer. Remember, there are three main ways that we can improve reliability. By repeating experiments, removing outliers, and calculating the average of repeated measurements. Anna has only taken one measurement, so she cannot calculate an average or spot outliers. That means she'll need to repeat the experiment and collect more data. Option D does not mention repeating the experiment, so this is obviously incorrect. If she were to calculate the true value for the critical angle and compare it to her measured value, she would be able to assess the accuracy of her results. As we mentioned before, accuracy and reliability are different concepts. Since she has only performed the experiment once, her results are unreliable, regardless of whether they are accurate or inaccurate. Therefore, knowing the true value for the critical angle does not improve reliability, 
so option D is incorrect. Option C suggests that Anna should repeat the experiment using a block of glass. However, glass and perspex are different materials, so their critical angles might be different. If she repeats the experiment with glass, she won't be investigating the critical angle of perspex, so her results will no longer address the aim of her experiment. Hence, this does not improve reliability and option C is incorrect. Now we are left with two options. Option A mentions that Anna should repeat the experiment with light of the same frequency. Meanwhile, option B suggests that she repeats the experiment using light of different frequencies. When we repeat our experiment to improve reliability, we should follow the same experimental procedure each time. Suppose that Anna changed her method to use a red laser with a wavelength of 650 nanometers. If she measured a different critical angle, she would not be able to discern whether this difference is due to random errors or choosing a different frequency. In fact, the speed of light in a material depends on both the material and the frequency of light. In turn, these factors affect the material's critical angle. Thus, repeating the experiment with light of different frequencies does not improve the reliability of results. For this reason, option B is incorrect. Hence, Anna should repeat the experiment with light of the same frequency, blue light. The correct answer is option A. Let's revise what we've discussed in this video. Reliability is the degree to which a measurement or test gives consistent results each time the experiment is performed. The reliability of an experimental procedure can be reduced by random errors. A random error is an error that has variable size and direction. Random errors are caused by variables that vary randomly between trials, such as temperature. We can reduce the effects of random error by increasing the number of trials we perform, removing outliers from our results, and calculating the average of repeated measurements. An outlier is a result which is abnormally large or small. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on physics, check out our first video on validity.